The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. There's only one pronghorn and it's only found in North America. There's nothing like them anywhere in the world. In this day and age, children need to get outside more. Family camping is probably one of the greatest ways to bring your family together. I got to ride out on a game-worn boat about eight miles off the coast of Corpus Christi and actually witness the sinking of a giant ship that would become an artificial reef. Texas Parks and Wildlife, taking Texans outside for 30 years. There's only one pronghorn and it's only found in North America. There's nothing like them anywhere in the world. My name is Sean Gray and I'm the Mule Deer and Pronghorn Program Leader for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Sean is on a mission to solve a mystery. He and many other biologists are trying to understand why the pronghorn population in the Big Bend region of Texas took a sudden plunge. We just pulled the right kidney. Through extensive research, biologists are understanding the factors of the decline and how they interact with one another. One fact is known drought has definitely contributed to the problem. As part of their efforts to help supplement the population, biologists are capturing and translocating pronghorns from the Panhandle to areas just north of the Big Bend. Catching the fastest land mammal in North America is not easy. Of the 200 captured, 52 of the antelope are given satellite receiving radio collars that will help with the research. After a nine hour drive, the pronghorn are released in their new home. Trying to get into the mind of a pronghorn is very difficult. Um, however, using the new technology, the new satellite collars will help us to find in those answers that we really need. We noticed that pronghorn were concentrating or uh, would run into a fence and, and they couldn't find a passage through the fence. That animal would stay in a corner. Pronghorn will not jump a fence. They'd want to go underneath a fence. Coyotes have figured this out. This is a map of the Trans-Pecos with all of the GPS locations from the pronghorn that we translocated. This is a zoomed in image of fences and multiple animal GPS locations. So we have pronghorn locations up and down this fence line here. And when they get bunched up in a fence corner, that's when problems really start to happen. And we had several of our pronghorn get killed by coyotes in fence corners. While the satellite data from the collars showed the scientists a problem, it also helped them find a solution. Here we have a fence corner, and using our GPS collars, we observe 
many of our pronghorn being stuck in fence corners. And so what we did was we raised the bo bottom strand of this five strand bob wire fence that was originally about 12 inches off the ground to at least 18 inches off the ground to allow pronghorn to, to move freely. This fence modification keeps pronghorn from being trapped in fence corners. And that result is pronghorn can access more country and it's also decreased the amount of predation that's going on as well. We're learning a tremendous amount each day and uh, hopefully we're getting closer and closer and closer to finding those answers that we really need to uh, help these populations flourish again. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. As on most weekends, Ryan Spencer is packing for a trip. We do about 36 weekends a year. You could call it a mission trip. I work out of a trailer and we go all over the state. It's a unique office, but I really love it. Ryan travels to win converts, but his mission is not a religious one. You might say he's an outdoor evangelist. I go from park to park and show people how to go camping for the first time. I'm an outdoor education specialist at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and uh, I specialize in getting people outside and uh, connecting them with nature. Today, Ryan is at Blanco State Park. Thank you all for coming out. Introducing some families to camping on behalf of the Texas Outdoor Family Program. Studies have shown that children who spend time outside are healthier, happier, and stronger, that they do better in school, and they have better family cohesion. So that means that children who spend more time with their parents outside become nicer teenagers when they grow up. So they're all good reasons, but we're going to try to make it easy for you. We're going to go through each item. We teach about leave no trace and how to protect the environment when you're out there enjoying it. We want to give them some skills that they can repeat on their own when they come back to the state park. So things like cooking on a camp stove, setting up a tent. We'll just unfold this thing like so. We've got a series of aluminum poles. And we'll just lay it through there. Watching carefully are Karenia Holloway, her mother Karen, and friend Isaiah. The Holloways have only camped once before. The first camping trip I did was back in December, and that was all new for me. And, and we had a blast, and I really enjoyed it. My daughter's kind of a natural at it. She just likes, you know, being outdoors, which draws me in. And we're enjoying today. I was talking to Karenia, and she asked me if I wanted to go. And, you know, my initial reaction was no. He didn't want to go camping. If something crawled on him, he was out. I, I like being inside with the AC, but you know, getting out here now, it, it, it just, it feels good. We need one more. Young neighbor Calvin has also been invited along, and he's pretty excited to spend his first night in the outdoors. Go, 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 go. He's been very excited today. It's just really hard to keep him still. Setting up the tent, I mean, he's just jumped right in there. You need help? When he first pulled out all the stuff, it was a little intimidating. Oh, it's there. It wasn't that difficult. Perfect. Yep. You, you're not alone. You know, you can do this. Just, and if you need help, ask for help. There you go. We got the strongest man on the job, though. <laughs> <laughs> this actually gives you a time to come together and just talk to one another and just experience life together. And so that's something that we don't always get the opportunity to do. Other campers are here for similar reasons. We thought this would be a great way to kind of get the kids outside of the house, uh, away from the technology, the iPads, uh, television, and realizing being outdoors, having some fun outside can be a great way to spend the weekend. Kind of like a trade. A little um, technology can help the transition. Do you know what GPS stands for? Does anybody know? know There's two spheres of thought. The one is that we pluck kids away from technology completely. And the other is that we kind of ease them into it. One day today. I'm kind of a fan of the latter. What we do is what we call a modern day treasure hunt. Geocaching, for example. There's a bunch of satellites up in the sky to actually relay your exact location and coordinates onto this thing. This one goes north. Technology may tend to keep us indoors, but geocaching combines gadgets with outdoor exploration. So you're close. It says what? Four feet. Ah, oh, they already found it. <laughs> I don't know where it is. 
I liked going around and flying stuff with the GPS. It's right in this area. Calvin really enjoyed the geocaching and just even seeing what's out here was really nice. He was on the hunt for something. <laughs> it has to be one of these plants. Oh! You found it! Everyone loves a treasure hunt. Where'd it go? Regardless of the treasure itself. What is it? I don't know, it's a piece of paper. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We spent a nice chunk of time locating a couple of things and the kids enjoyed finding a little treasure. By afternoon, the cool Blanco River is calling. Yep, it do, sir. And there's another way to enjoy the water. Kayak. Paddling a kayak is a new experience for Calvin. Excited? Yes, sir. Can I get a high five? <laughs> That's what's up. All right. At first, he didn't want to do it, but after we got in the boat, smooth sailing, you know, he was all for it. Yeah, Calvin, that's good. Going up the river, <laughs> down the river, yeah, pretty cool. Uh oh. We were out one direction, then we were out another direction, and finally my daughter said, Mom, just put your paddle down, just sit and relax. I really like being in the water because it's really serene, it's kind of peaceful, but it's hard to kind of steer. I tried. <laughs> they ran into us. Well, I don't know if you saw that collision. <laughs> but after that, it was pretty good. It was just something I had never done before, so maybe if I do it a few more times, maybe it will finally get through to my brain what to do exactly. <laughs> but I had fun. Never done kayaking before. This was the first time. Uh, so it's a little bit hesitant. I don't know if he was going to like it or not. And uh, he enjoyed it. And there are more firsts for the Folgar family, who hail from a place where camping doesn't come naturally. From New York City. The closest I've been to camping was uh, in 2004. We had a blackout. <laughs> but the lack of experience doesn't keep Aiden from catching his first fish. First one ever. It's a pretty cool fish, Aiden. Yeah. Pretty awesome. <laughs> of course, a fish is not guaranteed for every family. What am I doing wrong? But some guidance is always available. <laughs> We're going to go one direction. That was something completely like new for me, you know? going out there and really trying to work at it casting it. You make it look really easy. You have to really just get it right there when you're you clicking go. the button, but that was fun. And so I would do that again. I would. I didn't reel really in the gator, but you know, maybe next time. When I was a kid, I grew up in the concrete jungle known as Dallas, Fort Worth. Spent most of my life there, and we spent a lot of time just in the city. And my dad uh, sat us down and said, are you guys going to get outside? So he decided right then and there that he was going to make a commitment to me and my brother to go camping all the time. We went camping every single month for seven years as a family. And so I developed this real love for getting outside. And we're still very, very close, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we went camping so much. What time is it? A weekend is over quickly. Oh, darn. So one outing may not make lifelong campers. We want to leave the poles where they are. We make it easy for folks uh, to come out and try it for the first time. We want to time. make sure that you let it dry out. We try to take the scariness away from camping. And we're just going to drop it in. Thank you very much. I'm going to try one weekend can introduce the simple of the joys of getting outdoors together. They show you how to camp. We're highly satisfied with what the Texas Outdoor Families did for our family. We just try to make sure that the experiences that they have with us, and they have the confidence to go out and do on their own again. Uh, the next time I do this, because you know, there will be a next time I enjoyed it that much, I'm going to bring some insect repellent. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, definitely we'll try it again, definitely. My wife, she's eager to, to be a part of this as well. All right, we got everybody. One, you look at two, I hope to bring like more people the next time that haven't done it, just so they can experience it. It's nice to do something different and, uh, and have some nice time out with the family and friends. I'm the one who has to put everything away. Everything had a place and now it's basically just like... We'll probably try it again sometime uh, throughout the summer. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I think he'll always have this memory. 
He's had a great outing. I've been so blessed to get to help connect kids with nature and with their families. That's what it's all about for me. Families had a blast. All the stuff's back in the trailer. It's a good day. So with the last family packed up, Ryan's tent revival heads to its next state park. It, it revitalizes you to get to see all of these families come together in our state parks because that's what these parks are here for. To see a calendar of upcoming workshops near you, visit our website and join the Texas Outdoor Family Congregation. Hi Sandy, this is Lori, how you doing? Good, thanks. I understand you called about a problem with your accounting program. My official title would be system analyst, but we call ourselves park support or uh, technical support for the state parks. Um, Lori has been uh, the team lead for the park support group here in IT. She has an excellent reputation. You go to just about any state park and, uh, and you mention Lori's name and they know who she is and what she does. So only that one is misbehaving then? If they weren't doing what they were doing, we wouldn't have parks. So I think they are my inspiration for doing what I do. I'm trying to think, sometimes when things like that happen, there's something that out of the ordinary that occurs. You want to make sure that you get their problem solved so they can get their people on their way to enjoy their time in the park. But there's always something new. It never becomes redundant. Hi, Sophie. This is Lori from Park Support. How are you doing today? Good. I'm calling because our printer's uh, lagging again on the, on the timing. We have parks call that are trying to check in a camper into a particular site, and they're not able to get them in there for one reason or other. So we troubleshoot things like that, as well as any hardware issues with cash drawers, receipt printers, credit card swipes. We have two additional people, including myself, where we trade on call. We go a week at a time. We're responsible for any issues that come up after hours or during weekends. It can be in a few places. If you go down to the bottom right corner near the time, I know my family really appreciates the outdoors and what I do, so I think they fully understand the importance of the work. Hi, this is Lori from Park Support. How are you doing this morning? I don't think about the sacrifices that I make during the weekends because I know our park people are sacrificing too. So being on call, it's not a big deal. I enjoy it. That'll be Carol and Lynn over there. We're really lucky to have her here in IT. I think you wouldn't find a single person here that doesn't feel that way. Parks well like this, Lori. I'm really happy doing what I do at Texas Parks in my life. There's always a reward at the end, whether it be the staff member or the customer who was waiting at the counter for 15 minutes because something happened with the computer. So someone is always grateful at the end and that makes it all well worth it. I love my work. I really do. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Kyle Banowski is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. My name is Kyle Banowski. I'm the operations manager and one of the producers for the show. And I'd have to say my favorite episode is The Sinking of the Kenta. I got to ride out on a game-worn boat about eight miles off the coast of Corpus Christi and actually witness the sinking of a giant ship that would become an artificial reef. That was something I never thought I would see in my life, is a boat sinking in the ocean. So I hope you like it. This will be the last one to come off, man. In 24 hours, this ship will sink in the Gulf of Mexico. We're in uh, Port Aransas right now with the uh, Kenta, which is a 155-foot ship that we're going to take offshore tomorrow morning and reef at uh, our Corpus Christi near shore reef site. The Kenta will be the newest reef in Texas Parks and Wildlife's artificial reef program. Basically, what we have is a huge piece of metal that will benefit the local environment marine organisms will begin to grow on it. Fish will be attracted to it immediately. It's been cleaned of environmental hazards and it's ready to go. The next morning, the crew tows the Kenta through the Aransas ship channel towards her final destination. 
The reef site is eight miles offshore and in 75 feet of water. Roger, so we're within the reef site. We are in the very soon process of the deployment of the MV Quinta S. The Kenta's last passengers will pull the plugs to sink the ship. So the water will start coming in at the stern, and then gradually the water will fill up the ballast uh, tanks uh, one by one from the stern to the fore, and the rear of the ship should hit the bottom. And then eventually the bow will follow suit and it will land perfectly upright and everyone will celebrate. She's a little heavy on the starboard side, but so far so good. There's the buoy. The Kenta lands perfectly, ready to become a new habitat for sea life and a new spot for anglers and divers to enjoy for years to come. For more information about the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's Artificial Reef Program, visit our website. Use the interactive reef map to explore over 50 reef locations in the Gulf. On the south edge of Dallas is a favorite spot for mountain bikers, Cedar Hill State Park. It is an escape right here in the middle of the Metroplex. There's a three mile loop, an eight mile loop, and a 12 mile loop. This is a trail for everybody. We want everybody to come out and be able to enjoy it at their level, take their time if they want to. It goes right by the lake. We're right here at Trailhead. But even for the most advanced rider, there's plenty of challenge. You've got some really thick wooded sections, sections that you go along the lake, followed by some prairies, so, so a good variety. As you ride and you, as you run through the, through the park, you're going to be engaged. You won't be bored. Yeah. I like the diversity of the trails. They're not necessarily real technical, but they're beautiful. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We have a lot of switchbacks, a lot of climbing, some long slopes that'll wear you out. But of course, then that means you've got a nice downhill coming. There's always a reward at the end of it. Yeah. One reason cyclists enjoy these trails so much is that they built and maintain them. The trail itself has been 100% maintained by volunteer hours. Last year was a record year for us. Uh, we had over 10,000 hours contributed to trail maintenance in North Texas. And on this trail alone, we exceeded over 750 hours. That's in one year. Hit those mesquite stumps with your weed eater. Most of our work is in cutting back the vegetation. It's a labor of love. We take a lot of pride in the trail. We're out here anywhere from two to five times a week running, riding the trails, or maintaining the trails. This place is like a gym in the Metroplex. I would highly recommend it. Oh my gosh, look at the sun. Wow. There's stuff in the trees. Look, 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 look. There's like eight of them. Ooh, and that was close. Look at that. Nice.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motor tools, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpws.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.